And welcome everybody, Ed Dale here, and I want to thank Rich Sheffron for uh, uh, letting Michelle and I um, talk to you about something that we've been working on for the last three years. This webinar, we're going to give you a couple of very specific strategies to deal with um, a pretty massive change in what's been happening in terms of internet marketing, and in particular, search engine optimization. I think it's a good change. I think it's one that allows a lot more people to be able to take advantage of getting the free traffic side of the equation. And we wanted to show you how to do that. It also has a lot to do with being a leader in your particular market and your particular niche. But before I go on, I'd like to welcome Michelle McPherson. Michelle, you there? I am here. Hello, Ed, and hello, everybody who is on the call. Thank you so much for coming today. So uh, I am, uh, for my sins, the founder of The uh, the Challenge, which uh, has taken over 90,000 people over the last six years and, and taught them how to get started in the internet for free. And uh, Michelle, your uh, claim to fame? Oh, gosh, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> No, you know, I came into this whole internet marketing space, space with a focus on SEO, but um, with a side focus on social media, and so I've I've kind of been in a unique position to to merge the two, and to see how those two things have have connected over time. And part of that is what we'll be talking about today. So that's my, where I'm coming from. Absolutely. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about what we um, are going to talk about today, and. The this all starts uh, with a massive change. Google's changing their algorithms all the time, and we're all familiar with the Google slaps and and different things uh, that that Google have been doing over the years. They they are constantly tweaking and changing their algorithms, uh, which I suppose keeps uh, keeps people who are involved in the you know trying to get rankings in the search engines very much on their toes. But this year. Uh, in March, they did something very, very dramatic, and they had to. I don't know if you guys have been, you know, I was traveling a bit in January, and I was looking for hotels, and I don't know if you've tried this, but trying to find the actual hotel that you wanted to stay up, stay at, try to find their actual listing, as opposed to the dozens of other listings, um, it's so hard. Like, I actually got sucked in myself. Uh, I thought I was making a booking on the hotel's actual website. Turns out I wasn't. It was another agent's website, and I was going to pay an extra 20% on top. It was a real issue. Um, the low-content farms, the 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 these all these dramatic um, search engine listings, the e-house, and all of these sorts of places meant that, you know, I just ask you, how have you found searching in Google recently? It was becoming... A massive mess, and Google had to do something about it. Now, what was uh, very interesting when we have a look at uh, Panda, and perhaps Michelle, can you can you explain uh, perhaps a bit more specifically about uh, Panda and and what it was targeting? Well, aside from being just so cuddly and adorable, yeah. like I see on her screen here, uh, Panda in in particular was an algorithm update that Google put out and specifically its objective was to get rid of low quality sites out there. So let's talk a little bit about what low quality means because that's different to everybody. So what Google thinks is a low quality site is going to be a site that uh, is has lots of keyword targeted content with no particular value to the reader. So for example, I am searching on how to train my, my Doberman to eat people if they come on my property. And I go and read one of those articles and I know that you guys have all seen them that say something like, if you want to train your Doberman pincher, you simply need to be firm and enforce the rules in your home and sometimes you will want to give your trained Doberman Pinscher a treat when he does the right thing and it's just really like vague and top level and, and I mean you know yeah it's content and yeah it's original but that isn't the kind of stuff that you're really looking for when you want to find out how to do something for example. So that's the kind of content that Google in particular was really looking at with Panda. They wanted to get rid of this low quality content that in the end wasn't really adding any value to the internet and and that's what they set out to do with Panda. It's it's interesting when you um, Google, it's funny because you know we all talk about them being very secretive and we all talk about them being um, you know in some ways having it in 
for people who are just trying to get content. But really, if you're a user of Google, you want you want Caesar Milan, you want the dog whisperer. You don't want somebody who's been paid, you know, seventy three cents to generate two hundred words in some high tech sweatshops article. That's what the mm-hmm. user wants. And Google realizes this. And we realize this. And you know, you can't get away with um with providing these sorts of dodgy articles and dodgy content when you have chosen a marketplace it just you just can't you can't hope to be a force in that marketplace and i want you all to think about this as we're going through this webinar because this is where it directly impacts on all of your bottom line you know regardless of what market you're in think about this if you've got the choice of buying from site a or site b and with the product, the service, the offerings, the price, they're all pretty similar. But with Site A, they're the equivalent of Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer. You know them, you've seen them on TV, you've um, read their blog, you've uh, seen them speak at a seminar, you've seen them all over the place. And then Site B is anonymous and is effectively ghostwritten. Who, who are you going to choose? Who are you going to buy from? In all likelihood, you're going to buy from the people that you know. And this is, Google is has got an incredible bias towards this. Um, And they were very upfront with it, actually. Here you see it on the screen. This is the poster that was made on Friday, May 6th, 2011. And there was uh, basically 28 questions which they ask with regards to what is a high-quality site. Because the Panda update was all about not targeting the high-quality sites, but targeting the low-quality sites. We'll come back to that in a second. See, Google's a funny, funny beast. Um, If you get the chance, uh, this book, which just came out in the last uh, couple of months ago, called In the Plex by uh, Stephen Levy, is a brilliant read. You know, if if you're dealing with... um, you know, Google on a daily basis, if you rely on them for traffic, for pay-per-click or for SEO, you, this is a book that you probably want to read and it's a good read. But more importantly, it just gives you such a great insight into the way Google thinks about things. Like some of you may be aware of one of their obsessions and that's with this how fast your page loads. Like they literally use that as a ranking factor. If you've got a slow loading page, they will actually penalise you and not show you in that those precious top 10 slots for your particular phrase. And as a marketer, I'm saying, well, what's the difference? You know, if it loads at 0.2 of a second or one second, who cares? Well, guess what? Google care. Google care deeply. And if you read in the Plex, you'll see how they're obsessed by it, particularly uh, Larry Page, the uh, new CEO, is obsessed by speed. They have literally um, ditched entire products because in their view they were not fast enough because they their belief is that particularly you know forget us forget computer geeks but joe and jane smith they want their information fast they're used to turning on the tv and instantly having an image and google is driven by that so you know it's fascinating to understand the way they think and in this article they started out um by you know classic bit of google speak you know it's talking about people fixating on the panda algorithm change well guess what it changed over 12 percent of the index they've never done that massive a change in fact the change was so massive and this has come out since we've uh, produced this particular webinar for you guys um that the the algorithm change is so big it is not a dynamic algorithm change they actually have to yeah. run a special process did you see that michelle I did, and and that's kind of a big deal. Shall I explain it for a second? Please. Very briefly. Uh, A normal algorithm change, they set it into place, and from now on, that is uh, one of the ranking factors or whatever changes, changes, and it just is that way now. And so new sites come into the index or sites get updated, and that is they are then judged against that algorithm change, does this work still or not, and get ranked accordingly. Unfortunately with Panda, 
uh, the algorithm change is so massive that Google just had to take sort of a snapshot of the web at the time that Panda rolled out and it made certain decisions. This is a low quality site. This is a keyword spam type of site. This is whatever the case may be that they were looking for in Panda. Took that snapshot and the only way that if somebody who is caught in Panda updates their site uh, so that it falls on the right side of what Google's looking for. The only way that people actually see that and recognize that is if they go and they take another massive snapshot of the internet to then reflect it against Panda and re-update those changes that were made when Panda came out. So what people are seeing, the end result of this, is that they had a site that was affected by the Panda ranking algorithm change they've made all the right changes in their site so that they fall on the good side of Google and unfortunately uh, Google is not re-ranking them because they don't have that capability because Panda was such a massive update. Is that clear? Yeah, absolutely. And okay. and, and this is a pretty dramatic change of um, policy for Google and it really does mean that, you know, if you get penalized, you know, you used to be able to make some changes, get back. Now, it could be months before yeah. you see any change. So it's it's absolutely crucial to be understanding of this. And what was great, of course, is that they really outlined what they thought the process was. And this is interesting. I find this fascinating. <coughs> Pardon me. Sorry about that, folks. Um, our site quality algorithms are aimed at helping people find high-quality sites by reducing the rankings of low-quality content. This is the terrorist screening approach. Um, the basic the interesting background after the horrible and tragic events of September 11, of course, airport security, as we all are well aware, was, uh, very deservedly tightened. And of course, one of the things that they spent millions of dollars and had the best minds on the planet was trying to see from the information that they had available in the passenger manifests and people's travel records and all the information that they had publicly available, was there a way to profile and find people who had a higher likelihood of being a terrorist going on a plane. And they worked on this for some four years. And the end result, they couldn't identify it. They just couldn't. But then an academic, and I believe he was from Princeton, he um, looked at it the other way and said, well, hang on. Rather than trying to identify terrorists, can we identify people who are not terrorists? And guess what? They could do that with a 99.5% accuracy. They could figure out people who weren't. And this is the same deal here. Very hard to judge what high quality is. But I think you'll be able to find exactly what low quality is. Um, and Google went to define it. And we've got some examples here. So, Michelle, do you want to take this first one? Sure. So this is uh, these are the criteria that Google themselves wrote as to what makes a low quality site. And the first one of those items that Ed and I chose for you is, uh, is this article written by an expert or enthusiast who knows the topic well, or is it more shallow in nature? And that's kind of like what I was talking about with the with the dog training example very shallow, non-actionable, just surface information, ghost-written stuff that anybody really could have come up with off the top of their head. Clearly not by an expert, not by an enthusiast, probably just produced for the search engines, probably part of the quote content farm type of online marketing, and therefore not something that Google considers high quality. On the other hand, I want you to also notice that in this particular statement, Google is looking for people who are experts or enthusiasts in their niche. So how do they determine that? Well, Google's starting to pull in or look to social data to determine if somebody is in fact an expert, a market leader in their marketplace. So one of the ways that they might do that is if there is a Facebook fan page attached to a site or you know part of a site, does that Facebook fan page have a lot of people participating on it? Another way that they might look at is a Twitter account. Does this author, does this website have an associated Twitter account? If so, the other thing that they're looking for is not just do you have it, but is that person an expert in authority and how do they determine that? Like with Facebook that they want activity on it, with Twitter they're going to want somebody 
before they'll consider them an authority or an expert, somebody who has many, many, many followers and probably isn't following the exact same number of people back, right? And we all saw that in the follow you, follow me games that yeah, went exactly. on a year or two back with Twitter. So Google's looking for, is this high quality, or sorry, they're looking for it to not be shallow quality content, and then they're also looking for it to be written by somebody who could be considered an expert in that particular marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and again, you talk about hot off the press news. Google launched, uh, I think, 48 hours ago, the Google Plus One button, um, which we'll uh, sort of touch on briefly. But one of the things that they sort of failed to mention about that was, well, how they talked about how you can let you know your, uh, you know, your friends and uh, oh, what was the word? I on the tip of my tongue starts with C. They had this phrase which basically means people that of of your in your social circle. And I asked the question on Facebook, well, uh, Google, how are you determining who's in my social circle? Typically mm-hmm. you'll prove friends and those sorts of things. But uh, of course they're grabbing all of this information and data from all the publicly available sources. And if you look here, you know, the quality algorithms are aimed at helping people find high quality sites by reducing the rankings of the low quality sites. So, you know, does a classic example of this is, you know, are there duplicating, overlapping or redundant articles? And this is a classic uh, case. Now, we've often talked about, you know, people have talked about this content penalty. And it's not really a content penalty in the, in the sense that Google never, pre-Panda, um, they didn't, like, penalize you. They just didn't show over overlapping or redundant articles. They didn't penalize the fact that you had them on the site. Now, with Panda... They are, because again, look at it from their point of view. If all this site is, if there's only on this site articles that are, you know, uh, free articles that are licensed from other sites, duplicates, you know, old articles that uh, contain information and dates from a long time ago, why would that be of any use to anybody or anything interesting? It sort of makes sense, right? Um, another classic example is that, and terrifying for me, if uh, if you've seen any of my my work, um, is of course in spelling. They, you know, if is there a lot of spelling errors? Are there a lot of grammar errors? Because typically a site, and you've, we've all seen these, you know, these sites where, you know, there's some you know weird form of English going on, uh, where people are trying to write articles, and it's obviously written by somebody where English is a second language. And there, and here's the thing: spelling and grammar checking is very easy for a computer to do. So it makes sense that they're using that as some sort of algorithm. Now, of course, Michelle, they buried this one. This was, I think, twenty number twenty eight of thirty two in the recommendations. <laughs> And, Figures, it, yeah. and they they sort of just oh, they just sort of slid this one in, but uh, we think this is pretty important. Yeah, this is this is super duper important. So the quote direct from Google is: "Is this the sort of page that you'd want to bookmark, you'd want to share with a friend, or recommend to somebody?" I call this the mom test. Is is what you just created something that you would be proud to show your mom, or perhaps you know your spouse, or whomever isn't in this business of internet marketing? Is what you created something that they could look at and be like, hey, you know, good work there. That that looks like a decent thing that you did, even if they don't understand it completely. So this is important because that's number one, kind of how you can judge the quality is, is giving it the mom test there. Number two, like I talked about a few minutes ago, as Facebook fan pages and as Twitter uh, shares and retweets and that kind of thing and all the other different social signals. Now those are just the only two that they've specifically admitted to. Um, I, I would put all my cash on on the fact that there are more sites that they are looking at, not just Facebook and Twitter. Regardless, they are looking at these sites for social signals. Is this being bookmarked, shared, retweeted, uh, commented on, linked to from a popular Facebook fan page? That is a critical, critical ranking factor going forward. Like Ed was talking about, the hotel rankings being so messed up that he was unable to even find the correct site for the hotel that he was looking for. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the rankings have gotten so abysmal that really Google is kind of looking to us as normal people to tell them what's good. And the way that they're going to do that is if a site is socially shared. 
they've got the plus one button that came out you know yesterday or today became publicly available that's one of the ways that they want to do that they want to have that data in their own servers with their plus one button to figure out what kind of stuff people are clicking that they like or plus one uh, and so these are all the different ways that they're going to start gathering this social data and it is absolutely going to become more and more and more of a ranking factor it already is a ranking factor and it's just going to get more important so what you need to be doing then is creating content that is worthwhile for other people to bookmark to share to tweet etc and, and this has always been something that has terrified people. I think ever since we all went, you know, well, particularly me to high school, you know, when we had to produce a report or we had to do some sort of hand in some, uh, you know, 300 word essay on the, uh, you know, Columbus's journey across to discover America uh, and the horror that ensued, or in my personal case, you know, having to write an essay on, uh, and, uh, and I can't, I've blocked out a name, dinner at a homesick restaurant. The person who wrote that, that was a terrifying book. I use that book as a doorstop <laughs> to this day. Uh, but it, it's right, it's terrifying for people that, wow, you what, you mean we have to start producing really good and compelling content? I want you to stay with us because we're going to show you in this webinar right now some examples of that and how you can do this and how it's a learned skill. And nobody's born with this God-given gift to do this stuff. And you've, you learn how to do this, you will have such an advantage in your market. And in fact, we've got a phrase for it. Uh, we say, forget calling it content, think matter. Uh, matter is another word for content. But I love the fact that it, it's, it's that uh, double entendre of, of matter, stuff that matters in your marketplace, stuff that has an opinion or a point of view. If you're stuck retweeting just what everybody else says, that's a start. But if you don't contribute, if you don't put into the conversation in your particular market, ultimately you are in deep, deep trouble because I don't care how large a high-tech sweatshop you have. I don't care what SEO linking services you use. I don't care any of that stuff. When you are going deep into a marketplace, you are going to be contending against experts in your market. Think for a second. I just want you to think for a second of a favorite hobby or something you did as a kid as, as a hobby and think about those marketplaces I bet you you could all right now name a couple of people in those marketplaces who, who are considered the market leaders. And what's fascinating is, of course, typically they're not the best people, in you know, the most expert of people in that subject matter, but they're the best marketers. So we have a huge advantage here. So, you know, if you look at it, and we're going to show you some data in just a moment, you know, if you actually put together an article that is your own content and it's you know crafted for that marketplace, it's worth months of output from some high tech sweatshop in some overseas location. Because if you get you know links and tweets and Facebook likes and dare I say it Google Plus ones, well, <laughs> the jury is well and truly out on that one. But the point is, is that is the best ranking factor. Why? Because think about this in a world of, oh my goodness, how many options do we have? I come from a place, I come from a place in country Victoria called Beechworth. When I grew up, I had exactly one radio station and two TV stations, one government and one commercial. That was it. That was it. Oh, one news, did I say newspaper? One newspaper, one radio, two stations. That was it. That was all... You know, that was all I had available to keep me connected to the outside world and magazines, God bless them. Now, of course, think about what my daughter has or we have to deal with. <coughs> you know, there's an immense amount of information and in, in, in this flood of information, as Google themselves, as Eric Schmidt pointed out, there is up, on, if you take all the world's information up to 2003, Okay, all of the information, if you were able to compile all that digitally, they are taking, Google are collecting that amount of data every two days. Every two days. It is, it's phenomenal. So there's no, we haven't got a hope. We have got no hope. So all of a sudden, <coughs> friends' recommendations they become paramount. Think about it. If you're in the market for a car, you know, 
a, f- a friend saying, oh, I love my Prius, it's fantastic, it's gr- great mileage, it's awesome, that's going to be worth much more to you than some salesperson saying that that you don't know, that has no credibility with you. And this is fundamental to this. And this is this concept relates directly to money in your pocket. So let's show some proof in the pudding. And uh, we wanted to show this because you can uh, you can definitely do this because you failed English. Michelle, I'm going to throw over to you first. Sure thing. And uh, just I'll just give this over to Michelle here in a second. Okay, let's make Michelle the presenter. Show my screen. All right, Ed, give me a give me a holler when you can see the big green screen. Got it. All right. So let's bring up what I got here for you guys. All right. So here, uh, I think, you know, I'm the kind of marketer, I know that Ed is, I know that Rich is, who absolutely practice what we preach when we're doing this stuff and when we're telling you guys how to do stuff. So I've got a couple of my own stats here that I want to take a minute and show you. So this first screen grab that you're looking at right now, this is a comparison of traffic to my blog at michellemcpherson.com. The blue line that you'll see is traffic from April through May of 2011. And the green line is traffic at the same time last year. Now this year I published nine posts during that time period. And last year I had only published two posts during that time period. Everything else on the site remains virtually equal. I don't do any link building campaigns or, you know, I I haven't done anything to specifically uh, make my site more popular at all. But just by the virtue of publishing more, I'm getting a ton more traffic now than I was last year at the same time. So I've had about, uh, or last year I had about 7,000 visits, and this year I'm at 16,500. According to my handy dandy Google Analytics, that tells me that it is a 139% increase in traffic. Again, just by virtue of publishing more. Now, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat this. Of course, a year ago my blog did have less authority than it does this year because that's one of the key pieces of SEO. The longer a site exists, the more trust and authority it'll get in the eyes of the search engines, assuming that all other things are equal. So this one is a more recent example where those sort of factors don't actually come into play. So here we've got the last 30 days of traffic compared to the 30 days prior. So it's uh, March through April and then April through May. Um, The last 30 days this April through May, which is the blue line, is when I really started using curation on my site and publishing using a curation model, which we'll be talking about more in just a few minutes. And again, similar to the previous screenshot, I was able to go from publishing just two articles in the March through April date to publishing nine in the April through May date. Curation's a lot less fa- or a lot faster and a lot less intimidating than sitting down and writing, you know, an, an epic poem like, uh, or a 3000, <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking of the Canterbury tales for some reason. I don't know what that's got to do, do with internet marketing. I was marketing. only reading them this morning. <laughs> it sounds intimidating, right? <laughs> so anyway, you know, traffic's up by 20% in these, in this time period this year with about three more visits, 3000 more visitors this month than I had last month. Again, only difference literally only difference because now we're looking at a much closer time frame is just that I published more. Now because we're looking at a more similar uh, time frame here the site's got the exact same kind of backlinking profile it's got the exact same authority it's got the exact same trust and it's got the exact same on-page SEO the theme was the same the, the, the title tags are the same all that stuff because we're just looking at a 60-day time period where nothing was changed so the only difference is how often I post it now here we've got a site who had been posted to with quality and original content every single day for several years and that posting stopped and I think that you could see the dramatic and unattractive drop-off to my graph here <laughs> so the traffic took a massive massive dive just because it wasn't 
a timely site any longer. It wasn't a relevant site in this marketplace. This is a marketplace that um, that has a lot of competition. So it was very important that my site be updated so that it was the authority in my niche. And because it wasn't, boom, traffic gone. And that's a super sharp, ugly, ugly drop off. And I'm sure that you don't want to see that in your sites as this type of thing, this market leadership, this being present in your niche, both for SEO purposes and for people reading your site's purposes, becomes more and more and more important. Now back to my site, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, during that time that I showed you the April through May and May through June uh, of 2011, again, no formal link building in place, just creating content more and more often. This site acquired an additional 7,790 new backlinks in the last 30 days. And this is from uh, Majestic SEO's fresh index of backlink data. Again, I don't have staff who builds links to this site. I don't do anything at all except publish the content and then I let folks know that it's out there. I send out a tweet or a, a, a note on my Facebook fan page, but that's it. So 7,790 new backlinks, um, 3,000 of those it says are no follow. You could, those are most likely coming from Twitter and things like that. Overall, we've got 644 referring domains. And if you do know anything about SEO, of course, backlinks are still a factor. And yet, here I am getting 7,790 of them without actually doing any link building. So I think that that's something to consider as well. Yeah. So, you know, here's how I kind of want to tie how this all fits in for you and how you can apply it into your business. We've talked about all the ways that Google changed their ranking algorithms to be looking more for quality content or at least degrading the low value content. And one of the ways that they're determining your if your content is quality is by those social signals. That is, if your content is getting shared by other folks on sites like Twitter and sites like Facebook, and then if your content is being shared and it's being shared by users with high author authority, that is a massive positive ranking signal that lets Google know that your content is quality and it's the kind of stuff that people want and it's the kind of stuff that Google therefore wants at the top of its search engine results pages. So in this new era of SEO, producing quality content that's good enough for people to share is imperative to your search engine rankings. Mm -hmm. And quality content is also imperative to becoming a market leader in your niche. If you want to be that go-to person in tomato growing or in sausage making or in mountain biking, <laughs> uh, you have to be producing quality content on a regular basis, preferably daily which is, you know, something that you've seen Rich doing with his daily videos on the Strategic Profits blog. Whoops. Yes. And just like you've seen Rich's daily videos, the great thing about quality content is that it's not that hard. You don't have to write a 3,000 word article or for that matter, the, uh, the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> so <laughs> here I want to show you guys the workflow that I go through to produce some sort of quality content to get myself in front of my niche every single day. And the way that we do that is via curation. So what I do is I find the best stuff on the web and I share it with my audience and then I include some relevant oh, Michelle, commentary. sorry, I just pressed the wrong button here. Can you just uh, just go and select? Oh, yeah, you might have to my screen. pop out and show your screen. Thank you. My fault. No problem. Am I back yet? Yep, you're good. All right. So uh, the curation that we're doing here and that I'm going to show you guys how to do, it puts me as a market leader in my niche. And it shows Google also that I've got that author authority by bringing more content and more SEO value to the places that I publish in. So this is the process I use. The first place that you go in the morning, you may recognize this. I hope you guys do. This is a Google Reader account. And I'm going to go to my marketing folder, which is down here. And we'll take a peek. And I'm going to find a piece of content that I think that my fans and followers would be interested in. So let's see. Oh, I like this one. I, I happen to know what this is about from the headline, and I do actually think it's interesting. It so I want to, sh yeah. <laughs> so I do want to share this with folks. And once I've got a piece of content, I have a couple of choices on where I want to share it, and that could be. 
Facebook, it could be Twitter, and it could be also my blog, my main website for my internet marketing type of business, which is what I'm giving you as an example right now. So let's take this piece and we'll send it out to my Twitter friends. Up here in the upper left, I've got a browser button that looks like a stack of papers and it says add to buffer. This is from bufferapp.com. It's an extension for sending out Twitter posts and it works with any browser. Now you can click the buffer icon and it'll do that. This window pops up and I can compose my tweet however I want. Now I like it because it shortens the URL for me as you can see here and it also lets me edit the tweet however I want which is important to me because it isn't of much value to my marketplace or to your marketplace if you're just parroting what everybody else is saying. So what I need to do and what you need to do when you're sending out a tweet or any other reference to somebody else's content is you need to tell your audience why this is important to them. So I'm going to delete the title here and add in my own uh, thoughts on this. I prefer it as, as, as getting to know you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, always, you always have a way of, of shining things up, Ed. <laughs> all right. So I've got my tweet, and it's all uh, edited. And I have the option of sending it right now with tweet now, or I can buffer it so that it goes out later at a predetermined time. So I'm going to click Add to Buffer. And then I'll explain to you what that means. We got a confirmation that that worked. Now the buffer actually allows you to choose when something is tweeted out. Right now, that post that I just created is set to go out at 7.05 a.m. on the 3rd of June. And we use this, and this is, this is valuable because if I just go through my Google Reader, and I find five or six things that I think are great and that I want to share with people, those would all go out right now if I just put them in Twitter, right? And I would only get access to those five people who happen to be staring at my Twitter account right this second. Pretty unlikely. Um, and then those people also could get sort of irritated because they see five or six tweets come through from me right away. So instead, with Buffer, let me go over to my settings here for you. And so you can get you know a lot more traction from your tweets if they're spread out if they're staggered a little bit and that's what buffer helps you do so I can tell it exactly when I want my tweets to go out every single day and I can remove a time also if I'd like and then when I go over here and I click my buffer it'll schedule that particular tweet to go out at the next one of my predetermined times in my buffer so now let's talk about how do you know when you should set up your buffer to send those tweets out. This is Tweeried, Tweeroid, who, who, who knows. <laughs> These companies are getting ridiculous with their names, but this is a pretty cool tool. And what it does is it analyzes the patterns of your followers, and it tells you when you should be tweeting based on when your followers are online the most. So looking at my analysis here... I can see that on weekdays, I should be posting on Twitter between 1 and 4 p.m. But on a Monday, let's say, uh, I'm better off posting at 9 or 10 and noon and 2 p.m. So you take the times from Twiriyud, uh, however you say it, and you plug them into your buffer so that you know that your tweets are going out at the time when your followers are most likely to see them. So that's one of the ways that you can utilize Twitter and with the tools like Buffer and Twiriad to curate content. But let's say that you've got a piece that you found in Google Reader that you actually have a little bit more to say about it. It's something that you want to publish on your blog and you want to have some commentary about it because you've got something to say about it. So let's find an item in our feed that we would like to share with folks. Uh, that's just an ad for somebody else. I don't mean to make y'all wait, but... <laughs> um, marketing versus publishing. This is interesting. Okay, so what we'll do is open this article. 
and I'm going to show you how to curate this onto your site with just a couple of, of button presses. So we're going to find the part that we want to use as an excerpt. Oh, I love this. Love that, so true. And then I'm going to click the Postress bookmarklet up here. And you'll see I've got a window popping, popping up on my right. And I'm going to add my commentary below. So let's do that. Marketers are publishers. And this is so important, Michelle, right, with uh, getting, you know, being able to add your own comments and commentary. A key part of curation is it's just not simply retweeting. It's also adding your editorial comment with it yeah. uh, because it's so crucial in market leadership and, and hence getting people to retweet and hence getting Google to think that your content is excellent is to have a point of view with what Absolutely. they're saying, either agreeing or disagreeing. Yeah, and, and, and you don't have to be contrary and you don't have to be, you know, the Pollyanna who nods and smiles at everything, you know, just, just be you. In this case, I very much agree with them. Um, but you've got to come to the table with something to say to your audience about why this is important to them or, or your unique outlook or perspective on something. So with uh, Postress to finish up the demo, we go to Advanced Options. Now you can plug in a bunch of different accounts here, including Facebook and Twitter, and of course your own blog. And that's where I'm going to publish this right now. So we'll go ahead and click post. And the post will go live on my blog. So in this simple five minute process of checking out what's new in my Google Reader over here, and this is what I do every morning, I'm continuing as I send out tweets, as I curate stuff with posters onto my own site, let's see if that showed up yet. It should have by now. As I go through this process every morning, I continue to cement myself in the marketplace and on sites like Twitter as the authority, as the market leader in my particular niche. And there's that post, it's up now. So this curation process is one that you can follow, just do exactly what I did, and it'll give you an absolute leg up in your marketplace as somebody who's active every day and somebody who's got something to say, don't you think, Ed? Absolutely. I mean, this is absolutely a proven methodology. Uh, in all sorts of markets, um, I didn't really encourage you to have a look and and see the the number of markets. Obviously, um, for people who don't know me, I'm, I like Apple products a little bit, um, as you'll soon see. Um, and you know, the person who the, the 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 person who has the number one Apple blog and literally has hundreds of thousands of readers and makes a full time living from that blog effectively does this curation and then chips in with his own articles very infrequently, only when he feels he's got something to say. And being that curation is saving people an immense amount of time in your market. And uh, as uh, John Reese uh, once said when I was talking to him, and I thought it was so, so spot on, is ultimately a lot of what we're trying to do in our own marketplaces is, is help people save time um, mm -hmm. so that they don't have to be bombarded with all of this stuff. So I might throw back over to me now, Michelle. You've thank you so much for that. That was yeah. I love that stuff. All right, it's coming and, your way. Uh, <laughs> here we are. Let me share, <laughs> show my screen. And what I'm going to do is show you a different cut in this process. And what you're seeing up on screen now, can you see that, Michelle? I can. Your looks, beauty looks gorgeous. We've gone live to my iPad, my most favorite thing in the entire universe, bar family. And the way Molly was behaving this morning, the iPad may even just nudge her out. Um, it was... <coughs> pardon me. So, the um, you know, I love doing all of the stuff that, uh, that Michelle just showed you. I just wanted to show you that there are many different ways to skin this cat, so to speak. And to me, the... Um, I like doing all this curation stuff, not when I'm in front of the computer. I often like to say I like to do my social media standing up. 
And so do this on my iPhone or iPad. And of course, if you have Android, you can. there are various equivalents of this, perhaps not quite as slick or pretty, but still very usable. So I like doing this stuff, you know, in, uh, you know, when I'm waiting for the girls at ballet or, you know, um, you know, in the line somewhere and I've got five minutes to fill in. And so I like doing it this way. And I wanted to show you, you saw Google Reader there and Michelle using it. I use an application and you can see down here on the bottom, it's called Reader, spelt R-E-E-D-E-R. And Reader is a RSS reader, just like what Michelle had showed you, but it is so fast and efficient. Like I can do the things that Michelle uh, was doing on the desktop and I can do them, you know, even more quickly. So I've already had a run through. Typically, I would have two or three hundred articles each morning, particularly because obviously being here in Australia, um, I all the US news sort of backs up overnight so that I'm having a look. So I would literally be tapping along here and having a look at that. And look at this. See? <laughs> look at that, Michelle. Classic example of there. And in fact Oh what, yeah, look at that. Yeah. So there's Michelle's article. It's already there. And just to just to show you how easy it is, uh, I'm just going to uh, copy that link there. I'm going to go to my Facebook page on my iPad and I've got a little, uh, I have a little bookmark there because with Facebook pages, which are a crucial part of curation, because let's face it, with Facebook pages, you are dealing with um, the, you know, the most um, biggest traffic source currently that exists. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if you, if you're not doing something on Facebook pages, that's a real problem because every major site on the planet basically gets most of its traffic now. The big number one source of traffic is Facebook. So all I have to do is I'm just going to tap this link button here and then I'm just going to tap the old thing. I'm going to just hold my finger down, hit the old paste, attach that away. And look, it even drops in the article for you. And I'm going to just type something really dramatic. And you see, uh, it'll also include the picture, if there are any pictures attached automatically, which is handy because if there is a picture, you want to put it, it helps catch people's eye a little bit more when they're looking through their Facebook news feed. Absolutely. And I won't show it now in the interest of time, but you've got to check out that Google Panda video on my Facebook page. <laughs> it is so cool. Um, I'll take a peek. But I, I'll, I'll get distracted. Hang on. Let's uh, let's tap back here. So I'm going to just go back to Reader. And you can see what's fantastic is I can go through and I've got, you know, all of – I categorize my stuff. So you've got in here, you see the vital reads here, uh, mm -hmm. which are my – if I've got only a short period of time, I'm going to just have a look at vital reads. They're the first things that I'm – going to go in and have a look at uh you can see i've got like web 2.0 properties here and i've got you know different hobbies uh running iphone you know obviously uh you know internet marketing and you know getting things done sort of so i've got all of these different uh different areas so i can literally go in and if i've got a very 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 short period of time i'll do that so for example look at this so here, actually, this Daring Fireball, which is exactly what I talked to you about, you can see, look at this. This is a classic example of curation. Um, yeah. Where, he, you know, there's the article from uh, Seth, and then John puts in his two cents worth at the bottom. Uh, now, I'm going to do something else here, which is really cool, and show you a different way of doing, doing uh, curation. If I use this service call if I don't have the time to read this stuff now and you know when you've got an article and you don't have the time to read it right now well for me an absolutely magnificent service and you can use this on your desktop as well as on an iOS device is this service called Instapaper and what it does is it heads off and goes and grabs that particular article while we're talking here and stores it for me and stores it in a really great way so <laughs> pardon me you can see it's just so much more efficient to i think to go through 
and have a look at articles like this. Another cool thing is a lot of RSS feeds that you read are often cut off so that they only show the first paragraph or so. And you see this little mm -hmm. R box up here at the right in the top right-hand corner. If I tap that, that uses the readability function to bring in the entire article, which is just yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so this fantastic. is the cure for partial feeds. Saves you an immense amount of time because if I go and have a look at the actual website here, you know, and think of this particularly if you're on, I'm on Wi-Fi, but if you're on out and about, you know, you're waiting for all these ads to load, you're waiting for all this, you know, all this stuff on the side, you know, you're waiting for, mm -hmm. look at all that junk there that you're not necessarily interested in reading. So if I quickly go across here and then I tap into my good old Insta paper as an article, and it's even it's even got the latest thing I've copied, which is fantastic. If I scroll back, just tap here on my articles, and you can see I've got articles here which I've saved to look at later. And again, the things I love about it, uh, for example... Uh, this one's on a, a spectacular new camera, the Fuji X100. I'm, I'm a bit of a photographer. Do you know how when you're going through articles and you see like, oh, you know, look at these specifications for uh, those opt-ins or, you know, this link on iPod Touch, but you don't want to um, go off. And because if, yeah. if you go off to that article and you know, you're off, you know, you're, you're running around in circles and you never get back to the original article. What I love about Instapaper, it's so cool, is I just tap that, hit read later, and it'll add it to my Instapaper column as I'm scrolling oh, through, cool. which is just awesome. And then, of course, it has a incredible curation function with Instapaper as well. So if I just hold my finger down and I just select that little paragraph there, I can just you know, drag, drag it along with my finger here and hit share, look at this. I've got all of these different categories. And Michelle showed you uh, Postress before. I also have uh, Postress set up. So I can literally go email link with selection, send that off to my Postress site. And again, we've got curation. I can just type in a little element here, add my comments. I could paste in a picture if I wanted to. And off I would go, and that would be the whole, you know, curation done. And I can get through so much information on my market with Google Reader so quickly that this is the way I can stay on top of all the markets that I need to stay on top of. And if you guys incorporate this into your workflow, think of all the benefits. For a start, you're educating yourself and fueling up about your particular market. You are putting posts onto your blog at the same time, which of course, as we've proven, and we can show result after result after result, shows it gets you more traffic, more traffic, more market leadership, more opportunities to sell stuff to people, more opportunities for people to join your mailing list. To me, what we're showing you here is the most sustainable process we know for long-term building an online business. And this is what, you know, we've been doing this now for, uh, well, gosh, three years really in getting all of this uh, to work. But there are, you know, I've got to admit, you know, and both you and I, Michelle, uh, had lit we had our own issues, let alone, you know, people watching this right now about whether they're capable of creating content. Um, Absolutely. You know, the first one is... I'm not creative and it's just, you know, the th one of the best things that I've learned over uh, the past two or three years, and if you've read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, what a great book, um, but it just talks about the fact that there are no people with these incredible, you know, the, this gifted talent that it's just some gift from the deity of their choice it just doesn't happen it's not true you know people say oh well ed what about mozart he wrote his first symphony at six surely he's a genius well two things about mozart which most people don't know the first thing is his father was the foremost piano harpsichord teacher in europe like people would travel from all over europe to train with mozart's dad and do you think maybe 
that that might have been a little bit helpful for for young Amadeus, you know, having the best yeah. teacher in uh, in the entire continent of Europe to have as a might dad. Might have influenced him a little bit. It might have had yeah. something to do with it. But then, and that's not the best bit, you know, having studied, you know, my seventh grade musicianship is not worth much to me at the moment, although I can, you know, I can do a full symphony arrangement, not called for much these days, but um, I can do it. And what you'll learn when you study uh, Mozart is his first 20 odd symphonies were, how do I put this? A pile of poo. That first one that he did at <laughs> six, it was rubbish. It was really. It wasn't until he was in his twenties that all the stuff that we know and love, Eklund and Night Music, all of these, you know, incredible symphonies. Yeah, it wasn't until number about twenty six before he actually started hitting his stride. So mm -hmm. that's not really, you know, such a great example. You know, all these incredible kids that you see who seem to be piano virtuosos. Again. They've put in their 10,000 hours. It's just they do have a gift, and their gift is uh, what I saw best described as a rage to train. You know, they have the ability, unlike other kids, to sit in front of a piano for long periods of time. Most kids are not born with that. Uh, you know, I've got three girls doing lessons of various types, and none of my girls have a rage to train. <laughs> their mother has a rage to train. <laughs> Uh, we've got our equivalent of a tiger mother here in the Dale household, but mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, it's not, there's not a, you know, there isn't that rage to train. So it's all about practice. And this is the cool thing. You know, I, if you forgot just before the demo, I failed English. I actually prefer to do videos. I would rather stand up in front of a thousand people. You know, most people an, have an intense fear of public speaking. I would much rather do that than before a couple of years ago write an article. I failed English, um, which is not a good thing, uh, not something I'm proud of. And I have been able to slowly over time train myself to write a good old decent article, one that gets published and, you know, been published in magazines and do all those sorts of things. We're not also talking about, we've talked about a lot about writing, Michelle, I suppose, but it's not only writing, is it? No, it's not. I mean, you know, there's there's video and there's audio and there's images and photography and, and all kinds of ways that you can express yourself in your given marketplace. You know, you don't have to be in talking about uh, how to make video to use video as, as part of the content that you're creating. Again, just like you guys have seen Rich doing with his daily videos. Absolutely. He's driving in the car there in... Um, a very yeah. fancy part of Florida, and you know it's he's he's got the he's sat the camera on his drive to work and he's recording and it's fantastic, it's very mm -hmm. real and it doesn't take too much time at all. Um, you can choose your media. You don't have to do something that you are not comfortable with. Um, some people prefer audio. You know, some people prefer writing to talking. You know, I've met some people at conferences and who they are so witty and so clever when they write on their blogs, but you meet them in person and they're just acutely shy. You know, it's just, that's just that you will have, you will have something that you feel comfortable with. And the great mm -hmm. news is that you, know, you mentioned photography, Michelle, just using your mobile phone and taking a snapshot and using a cool piece of software like Instagram to publish it to your blog and, or your, you know, your Facebook page or wherever it happens to be is that's as good a piece of content as many other things, because often, as we often say, a picture tells a thousand words. So true. What about not knowing what to talk about? Well, I think that that's where uh, the the Google Reader, that process that you go through every day, comes into place. Because let's say that you're fairly new in a niche, and, and it could even be something that you're very passionate about, but that you've never really dove deep into. Every morning, you're going to go through the curation process, or evening, whatever works for you. And you're going to fuel yourself up in your niche and you're going to figure out what's going on, what's the news, what's the important stuff. You're going to start to have opinions about all that stuff as you get to know it better. And that'll be your jumping off point for your own original content, whether that be videos or articles or audios or, or photographs. But as you absorb everything in that marketplace, you can't help 
but start to understand what kind of things it is that people are looking for. What are the questions that people are asking over and over again? What are the hot button issues in your niche right now? What's the news that came out yesterday that you really feel like your audience needs to kind of know how that affects them? All that sort of stuff that you'll get from that curation process and from fueling yourself up in mm. your Google Reader or however you do it is how you will become so involved in that marketplace that you won't be able to stop yourself from having ideas of what to talk about. I think that's how it worked for me anyway. What about you? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, Robert McKee, the great uh, and very grouchy uh, screenwriter coach, uh, he says, you know, he goes, writer's block, writer's block. That's a lack of research. And mm. what he's saying is exactly that. You know, it's if, if you can't, if you don't know what to talk about, or you think you, you know, somebody, you know, said to me, "Oh, well, come on, Ed, you know, how much can you talk about wagon wheels?" And I said, "You can talk about all sorts of things about wagon wheels. When were they invented? Why did they go with hub and spoke? What are the best type of material for a wagon wheel? How's the best way to cure steel around the edge of the wagon wheel? Uh, what are different types of wagon wheel designs? What is the difference between a large and small circumference wagon wheel? Did they ever try to?" use any other designs other than wagon wheels how do wagon wheels cope with the snow you know <laughs> what did the royals use for their wagon wheels what's different about that different sign painting and designs on wagon wheels you know you can go on forever and ever and ever if you have that fuel and that's i think crucial you know and the important thing here um certainly my uh my academic achievements were not good you know i had to teach myself this stuff, you know, over a long, long period of time. Um, and Michelle, I don't know about, I don't want to presuppose your background, but, uh, you know, did you, when you got out of school, did, did how much of this stuff did you know? <laughs> I, I didn't have a degree in internet marketing when I graduated from high school. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, I mean, they didn't even teach us how to use computers when I was in school, really. Yeah. So um, obviously, this stuff has all been self-taught, and it's all been through through trial and error, which at times has been painful, but it's also been a, a great growing experience. And uh, and you know, just like the curation workflow that we've showed you guys there's there's a ton to it that we would like to share with you exactly and this is the you know this is the point is that this stuff is all learnable you know if you look at you know if you were to ask us you know what's the most sustainable thing that you can be doing what's the most ecological what's the most ethical thing you can be doing in building your business and boy we've got no you know look at rich i mean he's the classic example of this you know a rich shot to prominence, prominence in internet marketing with some classic, brilliant, well thought out, incredible documents that he produced. Mm -hmm. Remember those reports, which were spectacular. The, the manifestos and, and yeah, the manifesto, absolutely. which were just fantastic. Yeah. Really well thought out. A lot of effort gone into them. And now he's been doing, as he said, you know, on the mail, he's been doing these videos, you know, on a mm -hmm. daily basis creating content putting content into the market and this is a process this is the cool thing you can learn this and learning this it gives you such an advantage it's only going to add to your bottom line and uh, <laughs> this was an unflattering screenshot from his <laughs> most recent video from yesterday sorry rich um you know we've created and we're very proud of this uh, a course which is called always be shipping and which it talks about you know content creation how to create stuff that matters and how to use it for market leadership to show you how to do all the processes that we just demonstrated and how to do that. Um, Michelle, talk about sustainable uh, SEO. Sure. So we've touched on it briefly today with, with the Panda update and what we explained about what that means to SEO going forward. But there's actually been a lot of other updates that have affected the importance of content on your site and, and how that will change the attractiveness of your site towards the search engines. So we've got a whole section in Always Be Shipping about how content creation is in fact an SEO strategy and not just because then you have words on a page but very very specific things that Google has announced that Google is looking for or not looking for that you need to be adhering by and how you can do that with your content creation strategy. 
Absolutely. And then, you know, we saw some examples of this and there are many other examples of how to curate. So we take you through the whole curation process, the tools, the different techniques that you can use. Um, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, catching trends and, you know, looking at knowledge building and, you know, looking at market, what are the problems in a marketplace, doing all of those elements, which really make, um, you know, it's the first step and it's a first very easy step for you to take. Anybody can do this with a little, just a little bit of training and you can already be directly making an influence into the market. And then we talk about different ways that you can shape your content. And by that, specifically, I mean that, that kind of like Ed's touched on, that this is a process. This is something that he and I went out and taught ourselves, and it's something that we can teach you too. So the process of shaping your content, how you get ideas, how you consider the timeliness of your posts, um, the tools and the steps that you will take before you actually start the writing process. And I've got a little uh, pre-writing process for you that will make it so much faster when you sit down and actually go to write something or script something or outline something, whatever the case may be, depending on the medium that you choose. So the, uh, the shaping content section of the course is all about creating a process out of writing and a process out of editing so that you never get that whole blank page syndrome and, oh my gosh, I have to create something today. And, and, then, and then we then also we... talk about oh, sorry. the mediums. So, no, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, I was going to say, and you know, because there are so many pictures, video, screen capture, articles, podcasts and audios, sketching using things like the live scribe pen infographics we want to show you all of these different mediums that you can use because we know that depending on you know you're listening to this now there are certain things that you'd love to you might be somebody who is a great artist you love to draw you can draw cartoons that could be your medium video could be your thing audio podcast could be your thing writing could be your thing there are so many different things and so we want to explore each one of those mediums to show you how you can utilize that for content creation for market leadership and SEO, which is going to lead to more money into your pocket. Absolutely. And then next, we're going to look at the different formats of your posts that you might create or the videos that you might create or the audios that, we, that you might create. Again, we never ever want you to sit down and go, oh my gosh, what am I going to make today? I'm supposed to put something out and, and uh, you know, and, and do that blank page thing. So in this section, there's 21 different types of posts or videos or audios um, that we've identified that you can start creating and we talk about in here how to do it, uh, give you some examples of the best kinds of posts. So let's give you some examples. Um, one format might be the common mistakes in the backpacking niche. Uh, another one might be uh, reviews of products in your niche. Another one might be a day in the life of somebody well-known or not known in your particular niche. Mm. But we're going to give you 21 different kinds of posts like that so that you could literally sit down and point your finger at a piece of paper and go, okay, I'm going to create one of those posts today, an unboxing video, and then we'll show you exactly how to do it. So with this section, again, you'll never get that blank page syndrome. And, and then we're going to look next. at different ways of repurposing content. You know, we kind of look at the, you know, the reasons for that, looking at the different types, you know, there are people who are very attracted to visual cues, auditory cues, looking at, you know, different, you know, repurposing it for convenience and looking at, you know, providing the right information in the right medium for people in your market. Because in this day and age, we can't force people to come to where we want them to come to. That's very old media. Central. That's all. That's very last century. We have to be everywhere where it's convenient for them because some people might like to access all our stuff on a mobile phone. Some people might like to watch it on an Apple TV in their lounge room. We can't pick and choose. We have to be across everything. So we want to make sure that our content does that as well. You know, there are so many ways to do this, you know, using slide decks, you know, creating PowerPoints and keynotes for video, uh, using audio, creating an audio book, um, you know, a blog, which you turn into a newsletter. Um, you know, you can take obviously PowerPoint slide decks and put them into a blog. 
you know, you can use a long webinar and cut it up into short clips and push, push those out, pop them up on YouTube. Uh, you can take transcriptions of your content. So you've created a, a webinar just like we're doing here and get a transcription done. You can combine a whole bunch of articles on your blog and make them an ebook and sell them on Kindle. Boy, is that a hot, hot, hot little strategy right there. So we're going to show you, uh, you know, create how to take articles and put them onto video. You know, so there are so many ways of mixing, matching, chopping and repurposing your content so that you get the opportunity to get the greatest amount of audience. And most importantly, you're spreading your influence. And as your influence grows, Google's looking at you and going, wow, this person in underwater kickboxing, this person is an influencer. We're going to take their content and we're going to make sure we're going to show that content because obviously the market wants it. This is where it's all going. This is what it's all going to. Absolutely. And it's a way to get uh, a lot more leverage. You create something once, but you're able to use it so many other times when you repurpose it in this way so that you don't have to spend as much time doing the actual original creation, right? <laughs> Now, uh, next module, we focus on borrowing content, but doing it the right way. So we'll talk about places that you can find borrowed content, and that might be as simple as article directories. It might be something that, you know, you already know about, like YouTube or Flickr, but we're going to talk about how to do it the right way so that you're not facing, number one, SEO penalties, but number two, being on the wrong side of copyright law, because we do not want that. We do not advocate that, and that's not what we're talking about here at all. Instead, we're talking about where to find the right kind of stuff that is quality enough for your audience and then how to borrow it use it on your own site in a way that's meaningful to your visitors and of course that includes attribution and I've got to say it out loud because otherwise somebody will say hey you know we, we need to make sure that you're doing that of course this is the legal way to do it we're also going to talk about some tools that you can use to borrow content and then we're going to talk about distributing content and how you can um, get the stuff that you create out there and this is automation in terms of setting up certain workflows and things so that say what you paste on Facebook or what you post on Facebook automatically goes to Twitter but some other ways that you can use RSS and Google Reader and things like that so that everything that you create gets as much traction as possible by automatically being published to the rest of the world for them to see. Yep. After that we've got uh, some content lists Ed. Yeah, and just on just to finalize on that, there's nothing can be more depressing than once you've created a bit of content to go through the absolute drudgery of distributing it. And you know, in the old days, it used to be pain. You know, you'd have to blog, you'd have to code, you'd have to make sure all the links were right. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, we'll show you the way so you can literally do all this. You know, I often joke that I can run my business from my iPhone, and I'm not kidding. You know, so much of the content that I create is off the iPhone and sent when I'm on the road. Uh, because of those approaches and those tools. And, of course, you know, I think what we never want you to do is we never want you to be sat, sat there stuck for things to be able to do in your market and your marketplace. We want you to have that consistency because market leadership is that content times consistency. So we've got lists of, you know, ideas, lists of all of these elements which allow you, um, give you prompters, give you little um, ideas so that you're consistently and constantly able to continue to, to publish. And if you continuously publish, you'll become a market leader. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we've got uh, the mobile and on the go content creation section. And in that, you know, this is the kind of stuff that Ed was just talking about, where he can almost run his business entirely on the go. And, and by that, he doesn't just mean answering emails, he means being an active marketplace contributor, a leader in his marketplace as he's out and about. So we're going to show you the different tools that you can use to be a leader in your marketplace as you are not necessarily chained to your desk. We're going to talk about ways that you can do pictures. We're going to talk about ways that you can access Twitter, ways that you can uh, write notes or record audio so that you can then produce content while you're on the go and even upload and publish that content as you're on the go. Yeah. And then the last section of Module 6, Ed, do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. And, you know, outsourcing and using team members. You know, internet marketing in 2011 is a team sport. 
Um, and there are many, many ways that you can utilize your team to be able to make yourself even more effective. Um, you know, you can look at, you know, different things that, you know, different types of content we're going to talk to you about. The places to find um, team members for content creation. It can be very different from people who you are utilizing for like backlinking services and those sorts of things. It's different skill sets. I want to show you how to hire those people properly, where to look, all of those elements. Um, and look at the best types of content to outsource. There are certain things you can outsource and certain things that you can't when it comes to content creation. So we want to go through uh, all of those. And just lots of little tips that we've learned over the journey about you know hiring questions and you know do you get somebody full-time versus just getting people for a particular piece of content, where that works and how that is most effective. You know, it's... It's a very powerful leveraging strategy as you become, um, you know, as you start to really, as this stuff gets traction and you're starting to expand, this module is all about looking at ways that you can expand beyond yourself, which is fantastic. So, mm -hmm. look, thank you so much for listening today. We've really, really appreciated it. And I hope we've got you inspired, regardless of where you go on to this evening we've got you inspired about that creating content is not for people who are gifted at writing or video or photography. It's for people who want to grow their online business. And so what we wanted to do because, uh, well, as I've joked here, Rich does have photos. Um, <laughs> uh, is We wanted to put together a package for you guys that, that was particularly uh, special for this. So, Obviously, we've just that always be shipping. What we've just outlined there is over a hundred videos. Uh, we have uh, the course is actually rolling out over a six week period, and we're mm -hmm. pushing out that content. The first you'll be able to literally start immediately, um, and we're producing and pulling together that uh, that content that we just described and as I say it's over 100 videos we really want it to be uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica of everything with regards to creating content that matters but it's important that you know you keep be kept up to date all the time and so when things like happen like plus one did yesterday or you know the uh, panned revelations that it's not a live algorithm but it's something that is updated once every few months uh, these are things that break and we want to make sure that you are up to date with that. So along with always be shipping as a package for today, for you guys who sign up after this webinar, we also want to include 12 months of challenge plus, which is our monthly um, course that I do uh, along with the team at challenge plus. And it's all about keeping you up to date with the most recent techniques and the most, um, all the different changes because everything changes and so this is something that's there we have also included a month of our very advanced membership program immediate edge uh, which really goes into very advanced traffic and conversion strategies uh, which again we want you to have a look at and see as part of uh, always be shipping and of course it is you know almost goes without saying but if you try we'll it, it anyway. today, and we will say it, you know, for legal reasons, apart from anything else, is we have a full 30 day, no questions, money back guaranteed. If for whatever reason you get into the course, you don't like it, I forgot to mention that all those videos will have transcripts. Transcripts are being produced for each one of those videos. So for those of you who prefer to read rather than watch the videos, you can do it that way. Um, all the supporting documentation is all there as well. You know, but you've got 30, look at, check it all out. Don't like my Australian accent, drives you up the wall, then that's fine. Just let us know and we will refund you absolutely instantaneously. So in terms of the price for today, you know, typically a course like this would be, you know, $1,400, $1,900. But for Rich today, thank you so much for, for being a part of this. We're going to give it to you and make it available at $997. If you want to take advantage of those bonuses and that particular price, which we've done specially for Rich, then please head over to www.alwaysbeshipping.co. Uh, you can see it written out there on the screen now and take advantage of this particular 
special offer that we've done and put together for Rich. Um, so I look, with that, I'd really like to thank all of you for listening today. I hope you've got some valuable ideas out of this presentation. I'd love it if you want to continue on the journey with Michelle and I with this incredible process. We truly believe this is the most crucial strategy going forward. It's the most sustainable. Everything's moving ground, but the one thing that hasn't moved since 1994 and Tim Berners-Lee inventing the web is that a great piece of content will always rise to the top. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ed. And, and thank everybody else for, for coming in and, and being a part of this. Absolutely. And thanks, Rich, for uh, letting us uh, have a chance to, to, to speak to your wonderful audience as well. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll speak soon. Hope to catch you around at a conference or online somewhere. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at alwaysbeshipping.co.